line is going to be. Eight controls. A pilot can fly almost 45 feet. Remember, have fun and fly safe. Before flying the big iron, most pilots need to master the light twin. At UND, the Piper Seminole provides the perfect environment to learn about the decision-making and piloting skills required to safely operate a light twin. Ultimately, flying a twin-engine aircraft under normal conditions is fairly straightforward. More levers and moving parts may require a slightly more in-depth study of system components, but pilots usually latch on pretty quickly to twin-engine flying, and they're soon enjoying the excellent performance benefits that come with flying a twin. Where training gets a little more intense is when the pilot realizes that multi-engine flying is more about learning to fly under less than ideal operating conditions. It's about successfully handling the aircraft in the rare instance that one of those engines fails at the worst possible moment. The outcome of any engine failure scenario depends upon pilot proficiency, aircraft performance, the runway environment, and the extended airport environment. Each of these factors drive a pilot's decision making. For this reason, multi-engine pilots must develop a plan of action for the most hazardous situations, engine failures during takeoff and during the initial climb. With a plan that considers all of these variables, a pilot can react quickly and methodically during the event. Training emphasizes these points to enable a pilot to perform decisions on an efficient, recognition-primed level rather than the more time-consuming, cognitive approach. This only works if the pilot understands the hazards and risks involved in each scenario and has a plan in place. In this Aerocast episode, we're going to focus on the engine failure occurring during the takeoff roll in a light twin engine training aircraft, UND's Piper Seminole. Here's the short version. Abort the takeoff. If the wheels are in contact with the ground, keep them there. If you hear any debate to the contrary, that debate comes from some discussion surrounding larger aircraft with much greater performance and power. Simply not a discussion applicable to most light twins. So for starters, let's review a few key concepts that will lay the foundation for all future multi-engine performance discussions. First, let's define the very aircraft. What is a light twin? The so-called light twin is a multi-engine aircraft with a VSO of 61 knots or less and a maximum certificated weight of 6,000 pounds or less. With a stall speed that low, the airplane shares similar energy and survivability characteristics as that of a single-engine aircraft during the event of a forced off-field landing. Based on those specifications, the regulations do not require specific single-engine climb capabilities for a light twin. That does not necessarily mean that a light twin will exhibit negative climb performance during an engine failure. It just means the regs don't require that performance minimum. The performance values, good or bad, need to be determined by the manufacturer and made available to the pilot so that he or she can calculate the effects on their aircraft during an engine out scenario. To know the aircraft's capability, pilots carefully complete pre-flight performance calculations and apply them to potential scenarios prior to flight. In addition to normal takeoff and landing calculations, these numbers include the accelerate stop distance, single engine rate of climb, and single engine service ceiling. From these numbers, a pilot can derive a single engine climb gradient for IFR operations, and some manufacturers even provide a chart with this information. Prior to beginning the takeoff roll, a pilot should be aware of the accelerate stop distance and runway length. Those values inform the pilot of the distances required during a takeoff aborted scenario, and they answer an important question. If the engine fails during takeoff, can the airplane be stopped before the end of the runway? The accelerate stop distance in the Piper Seminole begins at the start of the takeoff roll. It assumes abort being initiated right at the calculated rotation speed and finishes once the aircraft comes to a complete stop. Associated conditions on this chart further define expected performance parameters. Specifically, the Piper Seminole's short field accelerate and stop distance chart indicates that the pilot will taxi into position, 
stop the aircraft, and apply maximum power prior to brake release. The aborted takeoff with maximum braking force will occur at the scheduled rotation speed, or the speed calculated from the takeoff ground roll short field effort chart. Always remember that during a normal takeoff, actual accelerate stop distances may be greater than calculated due to differences in pilot proficiency and technique from those used to derive the chart's numbers published during flight test. Accelerate stop distance is calculated similarly to takeoff performance with common variables including density altitude or pressure altitude corrected for non-standard temperature, weight, and winds. On average, the accelerate stop distance around Grand Forks is about 1,500 to 2,000 feet in a Piper Seminole. A typical general aviation runway near 3,000 feet in length will offer plenty of distance to simply reduce throttles, maintain directional control, and apply braking. Caution should be used, however, when a pilot practices stop and goes as there may not be enough runway remaining to execute a safe abort should an unexpected problem occur during the practice run. So leave yourself a buffer by either practicing on larger runways or executing the practice abort procedure at lower speeds. The next performance factor affecting takeoff decision making is the single engine rate of climb. Found on the climb performance one engine operating gear up chart, pilots can calculate anticipated climb performance for various pressure altitudes, temperatures, and aircraft weights. A pilot calculating this value for a Piper Seminole flying out of Grand Forks, North Dakota on a typical training flight will usually arrive at a positive 220 to about 280 feet per minute climb rate. And it's important to note the associated conditions and configuration applied to this chart. Landing gear up, flaps retracted, full power, and cowl flap open on the operating engine. Inoperative engine feathered with cowl flap closed and flying at VYSE or 88 knots indicated airspeed. VYSE is the best rate of climb with one engine operating. So consider this for a second. If the engine were to fail near the liftoff speed of 75 knots indicated, the gear will be down, the propeller is likely windmilling on the failed engine, and airspeed would be well below the target VYSE of 88 knots. The seminal POH lists the approximate performance penalties for configurations other than those listed in the associated conditions on the climb performance chart. For this example, the landing gear extended reduces climb performance by 250 feet per minute, and the windmilling propeller decreases it further by another 200 feet per minute. So, an ideal single engine climb rate of 250 feet per minute in the optimum single engine configuration quickly becomes a 200 foot per minute descent in the configuration described right around rotation. In this scenario, the aircraft cannot safely become airborne, much less maintain any reasonable performance required to climb away from the runway and terrain. For the reasons illustrated by this scenario, Piper Aircraft publishes the following statement in the Piper Seminole POH Section 3.5A. Discontinuing a takeoff upon engine failure is advisable under most circumstances. Continuing the takeoff if engine failure occurs prior to reaching obstacle speed and gear retraction is not advisable. Also, in Section 3.5a, as an appended note to the engine failure during takeoff checklist, stronger and more specific language is used. If the engine failure occurs during the takeoff roll, the takeoff must be aborted. If failure occurs after liftoff, but before 75 knots is achieved or before the landing gear is retracted, the takeoff should also be aborted. As mentioned in the beginning of this video, if the engine fails during the takeoff roll and the Seminole is still in ground contact, stay in ground contact and abort the takeoff. Once in the air, however, the statements from the POH do include the words under most circumstances and should. Among pilots, these words can leave a little room for debate based on actual takeoff conditions as to the proper action following an engine failure. Ultimately, the best action in any circumstance depends on the exact situation to include aircraft performance, pilot proficiency, runway specs, and the extended airport area's terrain configuration. This discussion will be the subject of a future Aerocast episode. Yeah. 
If ever faced with a situation requiring a possible abort during takeoff, there is no one-size-fits-all answer to direct your decision-making process, but here's a few helpful tips to help ensure the safest outcome. During the takeoff roll, successfully managing any abnormality starts with directional control. At low speeds, were an engine to fail, the reduced effectiveness of aerodynamic controls demands prompt pilot action to reduce the forces caused by single-engine asymmetrical thrust. Promptly reduce throttles while applying rudder against the yaw to stop the deviations from centerline. To avoid overcontrolling the recovery, make the abort control a distinct and efficient two-step process. Start by first getting the airplane directionally controlled and straightening its track, correcting to parallel the runway centerline. Once you're parallel and under control and have reduced side loading to minimize the chances of skidding, then smoothly correct over to runway center line as necessary. Once on center line, with directional control assured, promptly apply maximum braking. This includes maximum aerodynamic braking to assist the disc brakes and to enhance directional control and stability. And during all of this, if a dangerous asymmetric thrust condition continues with throttles at idle, Pull the mixtures to cut off fuel flow and stop the engines immediately. At UND, each pilot completes a TOLD card, referencing takeoff and landing distance information and pertinent performance values prior to each flight. This card becomes a quick reference in the aircraft for the pilot to organize, prepare, and review pertinent information prior to takeoff and landing. Decision-making discussions referencing this information, however, should take place prior to walking out on the ramp. This prepares the pilot for action during time-critical events. As such, the pilot reviews and briefs the information on the told card prior to taxi. Flying a light twin on one engine can be a very difficult task, but it needn't be for the informed pilot with a plan of action using performance-driven decisions. Take a second to complete all prior preparations, practice to maintain proficiency, and most importantly, develop a multi-engine takeoff plan so that if the unexpected happens, you'll be ready. Have fun and fly safe. <laughs>